Welcome into the install with Greg Cosell of NFL Films. Happy training camp to all of you who celebrate. Greg, I know your football season doesn't really ever end, but for uh, most people, it is a, a little bit of a welcome back to football situation. Feels great. Yeah, no, it's and you know, you know what I, I think I love the most because of social media is the fact that now every single play is commented on on social media as if it is the defining play of a player's career. You know, he could have a a, a really bad play and it's all oh, this guy stinks next play could be great oh no he's coming back you know <laughs> they, don't call it a comeback he caught the he caught the next pass on the very next play it's gonna exactly be exactly yes but, we're all no, we're all very adept at social media analysis at, at this time of year to be certain no but it's uh, i'm pretty excited i'm you know I, I i've moved on from watching all the college guys i'm now going back and watching nfl stuff from a year ago and trying to you know getting back in the mode and uh you know, it's nice. It's it's it, it's so funny how you see things totally differently when you see them, you know, five or six months later. Sure. You know, it, it's the, the way you see it, it's just different, which is great because it kind of opens your mind. Well, and, you know, it's it's at a time when you're certainly not as pressed for time because of the amount of teams that you need to be watching. So it gives you, I would imagine, a little more opportunity to maybe notice some things that you didn't initially notice on the first Couple well, yeah, you, you always see things differently when you can see one, let's say, a player or a scheme or a team and watch a lot of plays in a row, which during the season I can't really do because I have to get through so much. Mm -hmm. But if you can sit and watch, you know, I was watching Joe Burrow, for instance, you watch 200 consecutive dropbacks. You see that differently than when you're just watching a game, you know, first you're watching them one week who they play, then you have to wait another week and then you're seeing them again. But when you watch 200 or 250 consecutive dropbacks, it, you, you just see it a lot differently. Well, I don't know if you've seen 200 or 250 uh, consecutive routes from DeAndre Hopkins as of late, I'm sure over the course of his career, you've I've probably broken down a few. I, I've seen a little DeAndre Hopkins. He's pretty good. He's uh he's he's not bad. And certainly based on the wide receiving core around here, pre-DeAndre Hopkins, he is a uh, a marked upgrade on what it is that they were going to head into the 2023 season with. Uh Greg, just I guess from a fit standpoint, he he can do so many things, and he's such a technician in ways that obviously you and I have broken down before. Um, the skill set though that he provides. I think is going to help create for so many of these other guys who are still kind of learning their role within yeah. this offense. So many second year players who were really going to have to shoulder a lot of burden without the, uh, pro without the signing of Hopkins, which ultimately came to pass. Yeah. And the great thing about Hopkins is that he can line up anywhere in your formation and he is truly a technician. He catches everything. He's he, I've always found him a fascinating study buck because he's been a great receiver, obviously in his NFL career, depending on how his career plays out, he could end up being a hall of famer. Um, but you know, he was one of those guys when, you, when I always watched him, I was like, wow, he doesn't seem like he's explosive. He doesn't seem like he's sudden in his movement. I think he ran about a four or five, seven or a four or five, eight at the combine when he came out. Um, he's, he's good size kid, obviously. Um, but he always seemed to be open and he catches everything mm. and there's a physicality to him and a competitiveness to him that always stands out. You know, he's one of those guys we've had him wired a number of times uh, here at NFL films and, you know, just hearing him talk on the sideline, there's a, a super competitive nature to him. You know, he's one of those guys that thinks nobody can cover him at all. And, you know, he's just, he's a major, major upgrade and you'd have to assume that he can really help a Traylon Burks, who's, you know, a big physical guy with good speed. And, and I really liked coming out of Arkansas, as did many. And you hope that he can take that step forward in his second year. Um, so, you know, because because if you could have a, a duo of Hopkins and Burks, you know, two big physical wideouts, all of a sudden you've got a potentially decent receiving core, along with a tight end Chig, who's a very athletic guy. Made a couple of nice plays, you know, not to not to get no, too no, ahead of myself, no. Craig. Yeah, but there a we go. Of nice plays today. I saw some good chick plays today. Not too many bad <laughs> ones. We'll check back in on Friday, and then maybe there you go. There you go. Yeah. <laughs> yes, uh, it it is an infinitely more interesting collection of skill position players uh, by nature of his addition, and you know, I I think I think the thing, Greg, that. With Burks, you know, at some point, I think they hope that he can learn a, a variety of different things to operate within their offense. 
but he's just not at that point right now. And DeAndre Hopkins comes in, having worked with the play caller and Tim Kelly. Well, that's the yeah, that's the other thing. I'm glad you brought that up. I was going to mention that Tim Kelly was in Houston, you know, in the Bill O'Brien years, because that's Tim's background in the league. And obviously, DeAndre was there. So there's clear familiarity, not only with Tim Kelly, but he has familiarity with Mike Vrabel. Yes. And certainly that when speaking to DeAndre Hopkins, we met with him for the first time yesterday at his press conference. He brought up that relationship with Mike and the success that he and Tim had had together, uh, both as a part of the coaching staff with Kelly and then ultimately when he was promoted to the offensive play caller. Uh, a lot of uh, DeAndre Hopkins usage, usage for Kelly out of the slot going back and looking at some of those snaps now, he can from line that up Houston over. team. And that's an important thing because you want to be able offensively to have receivers that, that can learn, and he certainly can learn every position and therefore can line up anywhere because that makes it more difficult for defenses. You know, here's a totally, I don't know why this, this just popped into my head, Buck. It's totally unrelated to football, but it always struck me as as kind of special. You know, you probably know about DeAndre Hopkins' mom, right? Mm -hmm. If you follow, you know, now that he's a, 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 um, a Titan, you know, people probably researched his background. So every year when I go to the Super Bowl, you know, when I do Radio Row, you know, so many players, obviously they're not playing in the game, but they're there and they, they're they there with, you know, a relative entourage. Some have bigger entourages than others, you know, and DeAndre Hopkins would always be there and he'd be there just with his mom, nobody else, just DeAndre Hopkins and his mom, no group, no. And that, I, that always struck me as well. That's really special. The guy's there just with his mom. He doesn't need 20 people around him, you know. And I always thought, you know, I don't know what DeAndre Hopkins. I've never met him. But I, that just struck me as well. That, there must be something about that guy, you know, because obviously his, you know, his mom, because she's blind, I believe. Um, yes. Uh, and his his uh, charitable work, the foundation that he yeah. uh, that he operates is obviously uh, is is with his mother in mind uh, and something that he had brought up in his press conference as well. Yeah. You know, I, Greg, you, you try not to draw too many assessments of, of who these people are without no, and, actually. And, and that's a very fair thing to say in response. You're 100 percent right, because even the guys who have an entourage, that doesn't mean they're bad guys. You know, sure. not trying to draw the the inference that, oh, if you have an entourage, you're a bad guy. And DeAndre Hopkins, because he didn't have one, that makes him a great guy. But I, it just struck me is because so many guys are there with so many people. You know, that's the nature of Radio Row at the Super Bowl. And, you know, DeAndre Hopkins was there, just he and his mom. And I just always thought that was really interesting. Well, and I and I don't mean it in terms of a, a, of a negative skew or a positive skew, just when you can pick up some little notes about these guys who you see so often on your TV and you don't necessarily understand everything that goes on in their personal life in the same way that we talk about football from the context of we know that we're not in the building every day, but we know that there are certain assessments that we can right. make based on the stuff that we watch. It is cool when you can pick up those little, little notes of, of who these people actually are. And, and, you know, it's just a little more, it humanizes them in ways that I don't think we typically think of football players. Now, and, and getting back to the football part, you know, I, obviously I knew we were going to be talking again today and I know camp has started and obviously I'm starting to get my thought process back into the NFL. And, you know, you and I both know that the number one key to this offense will be the offensive line um, because they're, they're, they actually do not have, and again, I don't want to get ahead of ourselves and make people think that I think the Titans are a top five team in the league and they're great. But you know what? With Hopkins now and assuming development of younger players, you have to assume that. You mm -hmm. know, they're, they're drafted. Burks was a first-round pick. You know, Chig did well last year in his, in his opportunities. You have to assume continued development. They still have Derrick Henry. You know, if, if this offensive line can at least be average to slightly better than average – this is not really a bad group on the offensive side of the ball, Buck. I mean, again, I don't want people to think I'm suggesting that they're, you know, the, the Kansas City Chiefs or the Cincinnati Bengals or the Buffalo Bills or, you know, we don't want to, I'm not trying to draw any comparisons. I'm just saying that I think there's a chance if the offensive line can come together and they don't have to be the, uh, the best offensive line in the league, as long as they can do the job to some degree, there's some talent here on offense. Yeah, and, and that, of course, is the biggest question, right? Even beyond the wide receivers, we knew that the offensive line unit was going to take some some major work, and certainly that's not something that they're going to be able to completely rectify in, in the course of one offseason, given their financial limitations. Um, but that's the thing that they're banking on. In fact, right now, they they with without Nicholas Petit-Frere, who, of course, was suspended for the first six games of the NFL season for gambling uh, in the team facility, 
Now Jamarco Jones looks to be the right tackle in in waiting. Uh, he's a player who I'm sure you've seen a little bit of. He's played a, a little bit of football in Seattle. Yeah, he's, the, he's the Ohio State kid who was in Seattle for a while, and he played some guard as well in the league. But he was a tackle at Ohio State, and you know, again, I, I can't speak beyond that. You know, I don't have a, a a great breakdown in front of me of Jamarco Jones, but he's a big kid, pretty good athlete. You know, we'll see how that plays out. Certainly. And just the 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 strength of the offensive line or how quickly they can come together, as you mentioned, is, I mean, it's not going to tell the entire story of the season, but it certainly worked to uh, try and undermine their season last year with well, how quickly that unit performed. And that's the problem. If your O-line is bad, and, and we can fairly say you know, we're being fair and honest that the O-line was bad a year ago, then your your whole offense is you just don't know what you have play to play week to week. You know, that's why I said they don't have to be special or great. They just have to be good enough, you know, and then well, maybe they can go beyond that with for, as the season progresses. But that's really the starting point right there. And if they can function effectively to some degree, um, look, you have a people can say what they want about Tannehill. He's a veteran quarterback. They've been in the playoffs with Tannehill. You know, he can you can line up and play with him with no problem. Um, you know, now that they have DeAndre Hopkins, they still have Derrick Henry. I mean, this is this is not a team that is totally lacking in terms of skill position players. And so uh, just going back to those skill position players, Greg, we, we obviously were, we, we didn't see a, a complete sample size of Traylon Burks. A couple of injuries derailed his rookie season. Kyle Phillips was basically a lost year beyond yeah. the giants game, but with, with what Deandre Hopkins is and can do in a variety of different positions on this offense, how does that make life easier for the two players and, and you know, Chig and, and Derrick Henry? How does that kind of acclimate into what they project to already have? Well, I think in some ways it can regulate the defense because in critical situations, third and five, third and seven, those kinds of situations, you're concerned about DeAndre Hopkins. That doesn't mean he's doubled on every single play. You know, no no receivers doubled like that. But he's a player in those situations. And, and the NFL is a game of situational football. You have to be aware of DeAndre Hopkins. You have to be aware of where he is. You have to be aware of the routes that he runs from different splits and different locations within, within the offense. So in some ways, the term we use is he regulates the defense and that presents further opportunities and better opportunities for players like Burks. Let's assume Kyle Phillips wins the job, you know, who, whoever is, is, is the third wide receiver. And then, you know, it just presents one-on-ones or better opportunities, even in zones, zones can cheat toward a particular wide receiver, you know, depending on, on the situation. So now these players like Burks, like Phillips, if it's him, maybe it's Westbrook Ahini, whoever it may be, um, that they get better opportunities because of the presence of DeAndre Hopkins. Yeah, certainly that is the hope for uh, Ryan Tannehill. Went to him early and often today. I know it was the first day, and again, we're not making any grand training camp assessments, um, but it did seem that he was uh, did seem like he felt a little more comfortable with uh, throwing to covered receivers when the covered receiver in this search situation was yeah. DeAndre Hopkins. And that's the thing about DeAndre Hopkins. And I was mentioning that earlier is that, it, you know, he's not one of those guys that always seem like, wow, he's explosive. He's sudden, he's always open, but he's open and he catches the ball and you have to develop that as a quarterback. You have to understand as a quarterback that he may be a little different than receivers you're used to throwing to because he, even when he's, and I, it's a cliche, but it's true. in in the case of DeAndre Hopkins, even when he's covered, you can throw him the ball because he has a great way of using his body uh, of use. And he's got great hands and he catches the football. You know, he's not necessarily a vertical threat. He's not necessarily at this point in his career going to run by corners, but he can win for you and he can, to help sustain your offense and that's what you want because you still have Derrick Henry who's a sustaining back so you're always hoping with the Derrick Henry that you're going to be in second and five or second and four or third and three third and four and someone like DeAndre Hopkins becomes incredibly valuable in those kinds of situations well and that basically people are and I know Derek's only got one year left on his one his deal here but the hope for them, obviously, is that they can make Derek into a more efficient version of himself by nature of not having to run into eight and nine man boxes right. on a recurring basis to have somebody to, if not free up the defense, uh, you know, down the field necessarily. And uh, I'm sure there will be some shots that present themselves with Traylon Burks and the ability that he has to get behind a secondary. 
but just to just to back uh, back defenders off a little bit to allow Derek to get his first and second step in so he can actually well, utilize the thing that makes him special as a downhill back. And that's why, Buck, I'm so fascinated to see what Tim Kelly is going to do and why one reason I'm excited to get down to Nashville in a couple of weeks to watch some practices is, you know, I'm just, and again, you know, I'll be there two days. That doesn't mean I'm going to see, you know, everything they plan on doing. But, uh, and, and hopefully maybe I get a chance to talk to him a little bit, Tim Kelly. But I'm just curious because, you know, you, you don't have to line up with two tight ends and three tight ends and a fullback in tight formations to run the ball effectively in this league. You could run the ball effectively in spread formations too and it would not surprise me if tim kelly is thinking more along those lines why bunch everybody into a tight area of the field when you know if you line up and spread it out with a hopkins with a burks with even chig spreading him out a little bit because he's got speed you know do those kinds of things you can run the ball that way as well and it creates more space you create lighter boxes and and you know that's you're just trying to run the ball effectively. There's no one way to do it. I mean, obviously, they've done it a certain way, and you can't argue with the success Derrick Henry has had over these last four or five years, you know, arguably the best back in the league or the best pure runner in the league. Um, but, you know, there's many ways to run the ball. It does not have to be tight formations and multiple tight ends. Well, and the best offenses in the league oftentimes have a, a, a very efficient running a, attack to pair with their passing game because of exactly what you just mentioned. The Bengals have had a very efficient rushing attack. The Chiefs have found ways to run the football. Uh, and understanding that what, what we've talked about with the Chiefs is that they had gone back to more two and three tight end sets in the last season or over the course of the last season. They've also got a tight end who's a cent who's very much like a wide receiver and how you can deploy him. But maybe Chig could be that guy too. Now, I'm not, I don't want people to think I'm saying he's Travis Kelsey. We're talking about how a player can be deployed within the context of an offense. Okay, Travis Kelsey is arguably the best tight end ever, and he'll be a first ballot Hall of Famer. But Chig is a really, really good athlete who can detach from the formation. You don't have to line him up right next to an offensive tackle. You can line him up as a split or detached player. That's what I'm speaking about. So that that's the way you can create different different formation looks yeah and and to to go back to the point of of running the football and and the need to run the football in certain situations obviously the running backs have been in the news as of late Saquon Barkley did agree to a one a year deal with the Giants Josh Jacobs is still out there and of course a couple of notable names uh still available on the free agent market at that position Greg the value I'm, I know we're not cap analysts around here you and I but the the need and the utilization of the running back, as you said, there's so many different ways to run the football and get production out of those guys. It just seems that the conversation has become so narrow rather than focusing on, OK, the, the, the players in certain uh, certain systems right. and the way that they're being deployed, as opposed to making it about the individual player and what it is that they bring to the table. Well, unfortunately, the, the conversations become binary and it shouldn't be because it's a very nuanced thing. And it's it's very team specific. It's very player specific. It's how you structure a, a, a team and an offense philosophically. I don't think anybody would argue that running the ball is not important. OK, at some point, you've got to be able to run the ball. Now, that that there's an offshoot to that that can go in five different directions. That doesn't mean you have to build your offense around a running back. That doesn't mean that the running back is unimportant. You know, th this subject is very, very nuanced. There's a lot that's involved. And I'm not a cap guy. I don't follow the numbers. Um, most people, I think, would argue that if you're going to be a great offense with a chance to get to and win a Super Bowl, that the quarterback would probably have to be the driving force of your offense as opposed to a running back. But there are exceptions. Look. We talked about this with with your Titans. The Titans in 2019 made it to the AFC Championship game. Uh, Derrick Henry was clearly the foundation of the offense. Tannehill did have a really good season that year, as you know. Um, but clearly, th the offense was driven by Derrick Henry. Can it be done? Of course. Can you draft running backs late and have them be a factor? Sure you can. Um, I think the... The example in the Super Bowl is a poor one where the, the Chiefs ran the ball to start the third quarter and people said, oh, it's Pacheco. He was a seventh round pick. But don't forget, they have Patrick Mahomes. Patrick Mahomes is on his way to arguably being one of the best three or four quarterbacks to ever play the game. So, you know, every situation is different. Um, and, and it's just it's more nuanced, more detailed. There's a lot that goes into it. It's not just a matter of saying running backs don't matter. Running backs do matter, but it's it's situational and it's team and philosophy specific. 
Well, it's I, and Greg, you and I have talked about this a million times and, and understanding the way that teams who do run the football, especially the team like the Titans, who have gotten explosive plays out of the rushing attack, yeah. how much more often those are defensive, uh, defensive, uh, uh, somebody's missed a gap or something like that. And the running back has found a, a hole to be able to take the ball uh, for, you know, an explosive gain or something like that. Not necessarily because the running back is that much better than the players in front of him or the offensive line has done that much better of a job, but because sometimes defenses make mistakes and it allows for explosive plays like that. And, and running backs in the running game, it's funny, they don't matter until they matter. Think back to the Super Bowl a couple of years ago when the Bengals got the ball with, I can't, I don't have the time right in front of me, but they got the ball with what, four or five minutes to go, it, you know, and that's where you want to be able to run the ball. And they couldn't run out the clock and they had to punt the ball back to the Rams who then scored the winning touchdown. Now, again, that's just one example that, that, doesn't prove anything one way or the other other than to say that there are times when you do have to run the ball so whatever that means in your mind as far as as you know what, what you how you value running backs but to just to say you know platitudinous statements like running backs don't matter or you know that to me those kinds of things are silly this stuff is too nuanced to make those those sort of strong definitive statements that have no leeway uh, that's why you're my source of sanity once a week, Greg. I can, <laughs> I can, I can dip out of the sports talk radio world for about 30 minutes every Wednesday and have a little bit of nuance and uh, and and better discussion around the topics that are very very quickly uh, weaponized for lack of. Ah. <laughs> uh, Greg, always a pleasure to chat. Excited to have you here in Nashville. I'm sure we'll have some exciting things for people as a result of that. Always good to see you in person and talk some shop. And uh, and and when we got to do it on Zoom, and when we got to do it in a parking lot, wherever it, wherever, yeah, wherever, wherever it is, Mark, you know, we're making it work. Greg, appreciate your time as always, my friend. I'll talk to you next Wednesday. Thanks, Buck. Appreciate it.